to our hearts that we to whom the incarnation of Christ thy Son was made known by the message of an angel may by his passion and cross be brought to the glory of his resurrection through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. This is Father Benedict O'Kinsla, pastor of Our Lady of Victory in Delhi. Thank you for listening to Sacred Heart Catholic Radio. 740 WNOP Newport, 910 WPFB Middletown, or get the app, stream, podcast, and more at sacredheartradio.com. It is a Friday morning. It is the ninth day of the month of February. Let's begin together in prayer in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Lord, have mercy on us, for we have sinned. Hold back the punishment we fear. Grant us the healing for which we long. Lift from us the burden of our guilt. Grant us the freedom we have sold for illusions of pleasure or power. Strengthen our longing for goodness. Remove our foolish preferences for sinful rewards. God, our healer and our good, you sent your Son to cure the world's sickness by taking upon himself the burden of its guilt. Heal the diseased vision that causes us to mistake evil for good. Heal the sickened mind that causes us to mistake selfishness for love. Heal the unhealthy habits that we have made our own so that we may stand before you whole in body, soul, and spirit to sing your praise forever with all the saints through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. It is a better way to start a Friday morning. The Sunrise Morning Show here on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. I'm Matt Swain. Anna Mitchell has news. Paul Lockman at the controls. Travis has a video feed up and running in the show notes at sunrisemorningshow.com. Click on over to our Facebook page. Click on over to our YouTube page and subscribe so you can get all kinds of fun extras. Up this hour, Chris McGregor is going to be along, and she's going to talk about St. Scholastica, whose feast is this weekend. Rita Heikenfeld will have some home remedies involving Bible foods and herbs. Uh, a couple of tummy ones, but lots of throat ones. And I bet you that some of you uh, will be wanting to take uh, copious notes on Rita's home remedies. Ken Craycraft is going to be along to talk about death of a salesman and what we can learn from that uh, famous story of Willie Loman uh, as Christians. And then Father Hezekiah Carnazzo will look ahead to the last Sunday in ordinary time for a while and uh, look at the Mass readings that we'll hear this weekend. So stay with us if you can. Right now it's two minutes past. Here's Anna Mitchell with news. Good morning. The U.S. says it does not support an Israeli attack in the Gaza city of Rafa. The city in the southern end of the Gaza Strip is packed with more than a million Palestinians, many of them refugees in the war between Israel and Hamas. A State Department spokesman yesterday said an Israeli ground operation in the city would be, quote, a disaster and that Washington has yet to see, quote, any evidence of serious planning for such an attack. Rafa is a major entry point for humanitarian aid in Gaza. Meanwhile, in Washington, a bill to provide aid to Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan is moving forward in the Senate. Mark Mayfield has more. The Senate voted in favor of advancing the foreign aid package on Thursday after Republicans in the chamber rejected a broader bill including border policy changes. The 67 to 32 vote means that the Senate can begin consideration of the $95 billion package. It's still unclear if the aid package can ultimately make it through Congress. I'm Mark Mayfield. Former President Trump has won the Republican caucuses in Nevada. Yesterday evening, he won in a landslide just hours after he also secured a victory in the U.S. Virgin Islands caucuses. Trump did not face any major competition in Nevada as GOP opponent Nikki Haley chose to compete in the primary on Tuesday. And so Trump has claimed all of 20, all 26 of Nevada's GOP delegates, moving him one step closer to the Republican presidential nomination. President Biden yesterday praised the special counsel's decision to not file charges against him for retaining classified documents. Biden noted that the special counsel's report laid out 
some differences between Biden's and Trump's handling of classified materials. The report does note Biden voluntarily returned the documents and cooperated with the investigation, while Trump now faces an indictment, an indictment for allegedly obstructing the government's efforts to retrieve classified materials. Trump has said the lack of charges in Biden's report is, quote, selective prosecution. Pope Francis met yesterday with members of the Dicastery for Divine Worship and Discipline of the Sacraments, speaking to them about the reform of the liturgy. From Vatican Radio, Francesca Merlo reports. Pope Francis opened his discourse by noting that even 60 years after the promulgation of the Sacrosanctum Concilium, it is still highly relevant as it contains a precise will to reform the Church in its fundamental dimensions. The Pope noted that it is a profound work of spiritual, pastoral, ecumenical and missionary renewal and that without a liturgical reform, there is no reform of the Church. In the spirit of synodal collaboration between the dicasteries, Pope Francis expressed his desire that the question of liturgical formation of ordained ministers be handled together with the Dicastery for Culture and Education, with the Dicastery for the Clergy, and with the Dicastery for Institutes of Consecrated Life and Societies of Apostolic Life, so that each one may offer its own specific contribution. It is necessary to ensure that the formation of ordained ministers also increasingly has a liturgical sapiential imprint, the Pope said, both in the curriculum of theological studies and in the life experience of seminaries. Bringing his discourse to a close, Pope Francis stressed that as we prepare new formation paths for ministers, we must at the same time think of those intended for the people of God. The first concrete opportunities for liturgical formation, the Holy Father noted, are Sundays and the feast days celebrated throughout the liturgical year. Finally, Pope Francis reminded those present that their task is great and beautiful. And for this, he concludes, I thank you so much and I bless you from my heart. I am Francesca Merlo. And ticket prices are surging for this Sunday's Super Bowl. Ticket platform StubHub says it's on pace to be the most expensive Super Bowl ever with tickets for the game at Allegiant Stadium in Las Vegas now selling for $8,600 on average. A spokesperson for StubHub says there's rising demand to see the match between the 49ers and Kansas City Chiefs. He said... 38% of ticket sales so far have been from California, while 10% have been from Kansas and Missouri. Interesting. So that's less than 50% when you combine all of that. I know. There's all those people. On StubHub. You know, famous people and rich people and all kinds of other cities who just want to go to the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. So, uh, to be honest, I thought it was going to be worse than that. My real surprise. Uh, is actually how low of a ticket that is. That's average. You know, I mean, how low of an average that I means. That means that you can get probably a five thousand dollars Super Bowl ticket if you wanted to. <laughs> Not that I would, because I like being able to go to bed at halftime. Uh, but um, I, uh, yeah, there's there's a lot to think about with the Super Bowl. But I I, I will say this, Anna Mitchell, that I I don't know. I, everybody's talking about how Taylor Swift is going to play somewhere one morning and then is going to be able to make it there for the game, supposedly. Mm-hmm. That's, that's you know, whatever. I'm wondering how all these ushers are going to do the first 830 mass and the 1130 mass and finally make it all the way to Vegas for the Super Bowl by halftime. I hear Travis laughing in the background at you. So you at least got one laugh out of that. Ah, come on. Thank you, Travis. Travis, I'm sorry I said that. I don't know if his laugh came through on my microphone, but... (laughs) It's it. You're... Yeah, just... We're we're done here. We're done here. We're going to move on. (laughs) Today is Friday, February the 9th. So happy to have you along with us on a Friday morning here on the Sunrise Morning Show. It's nine past... Happy to welcome back to the Sunrise Morning Show, Chris McGregor from DiscerningHearts.com. Good morning, Chris. 
Good morning. I'm so happy that you're happy about that. I am always <laughs> so, 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 so happy to get to talk to you because you have such great discernment when it comes to uh, your selections for the Office of Readings that we get to discuss each week. And I absolutely love your pick, which is for the Feast of St. Scholastica on February 10th. Now, for those who may not be familiar with her, who is St. Scholastica? St. Scholastica is so important to the Benedictine tradition and to the uh, those who are Benedictines, the sisters, the brothers, the fathers, and also the Oblates. But I think she is also very important to the world because she was born in Nursia. She's the twin sister of St. Benedict. And she was dedicated to God at a very early age and followed her brother to Cassino, Monte Cassino. And it's um, when St. Benedict, after their parents died and he had chosen to follow the religious life, her, call, her calling was similar and he provided for her. And so she was in a monastery of some other women who were at the base of Monte Cassino. And there she was in great uh, prayer and, and uh, just reflection and devotion to the Lord. Absolutely. Tremendous witness tremendous witness as is her twin brother of course and mm -hmm. so the reading that we have for her feast day in the office of readings kind of famous story written by pope saint gregory the great who wrote the life of of saint benedict because he was a benedictine himself i believe um mm -hmm. now before we get on um reflecting on on some of the specific points that that gregory makes in in this passage um, can you just tell us the story of Benedict Scholastica and the storm? Well, this is uh, quite a moment. They're both now older, having lived uh, a life in seeking out to doing the Lord's will. Of course, Benedict uh, by now has pulled from all the great traditions uh, a rule for Benedictines that would be the basis for Western monasticism. And living in community, the experience of Lexio Divina, the the balance of celebrating the day and um, throughout the day of prayer and work and so many other things. But now they're at this point in their life in beautiful Monte Cassino. He built a monastery that is at the top of the mountain. And it's one of the most lovely areas in all of Italy. I encourage people to go. It was bombed out in World War II mm -hmm. and rebuilt uh, essentially, their foundations were still there, but the, the the monastery itself was rebuilt, and it's so beautiful. And she was at the base of that, and so there came to be a time once a year where they would meet, and at uh, and discuss the spiritual life, discuss holy things. It's just wonderful spiritual conversation which fueled the, the relationship for a whole year. And, and this became a practice for them. And then what happened? Well, there came a time when Benedict went down and was with several others, but entered into a conversation with her. Now, according to the Holy Rule, he's not supposed to leave the monastery, but he makes an exception in this particular case. And when they're they're so enthralled they're having such a wonderful conversation but night is coming and he needs to get back onto the top of the mountain and scholastica says please stay and he says no no i can't so she quiets herself and begins to pray not anxiously not um with the, that type of anxious prayer all oh, come on and begs and pleads but just quietly prays and a great storm erupts and it's so intense that Benedict looks out and, and he said, what have you done? <laughs> and she said, well, I asked you and you didn't listen. So I asked God and he did. Mm. And so they ended up spending the, the night in spiritual conversation um, just to make this beautiful story sh a little shorter. And I encourage people to go to the Office of Readings to, to read what uh, Pope Gregory the Great uh, would write about this. He would be traveling back up to Casino, and at some at some time in that journey, he saw a dove, and he knew in his heart of hearts that that was Scholastica's soul, yeah. that she had died, and 
from that moment, her body was brought back to the monastery. And when eventually when Benedict passed, his both their remains were placed in the same crypt. Mm. And you can go there today, 1,500 years later, and, you know, they started in the womb, and they're still together in the tomb. It's below, it. if you go there, there's a high altar, a big, you know, the main entrance to the church, you go down to a second level crypt. But if you're, if you ask the sacristan, he will, you knock and you ask nicely, he'll take you down to an even lower level. And that's where the, the oh, actual wow. box, where the actual, the, where their bones oh. are there. Wow. Just beautiful. Incredible. I just want your reflection on this one line from, from Gregory that, that really makes me tear up. It says, it is not surprising that she was more effective than he, since as John says, God is love. It was absolutely right that she could do more, as she loved more. That's right. She was so close to the Lord. She knew how to pray. She knew how to, um, for the, all of us, God is love. And so those who love much know him, and he knows them. And that's, you know, that's how miracles happen. And they have just such an abiding faith and trust. There's no anxiety in their prayer. You know, you have you see it in, in the prayer of Mother Teresa, the countless stories of what her prayer was like because she loved God more. Yeah, absolutely. Just a beautiful reflection that you can read in the Office of Readings from Pope St. Gregory the Great on the life of St. Benedict and St. Scholastica and that famous story of the storm such a great, great, great story to put in the Office of Readings for the Feast of St. Scholastica on February the 10th. We've been talking about it with Chris McGregor from DiscerningHearts.com, which you can find linked at SunriseMorningShow.com. Chris, thank you. Thank you, Anna. God bless you. You too. Thank you very much. All right. It's 16 past now on the Sunrise Morning Show. We're back with headlines right after this. Support is from MediShare. Let's see, if something costs less, but people are happier with it, that sounds like something to look into. And that is MediShare. Maybe you've heard switching to MediShare to pay for health care can save many families up to 500 bucks a month. And that is huge. But it's also true that people are way more satisfied after making the switch, too. The member satisfaction rate for MediShare is double that of the typical health insurance plan. Double. MediShare works, too. It's been around for 30 years. Members have shared more than $5 billion of each other's bills. People love having telehealth and a huge nationwide PPO network. So, yeah, really, you can save a ton and like it better. Imagine being happy with how you're taking care of your health care. So if you're self-employed or part of the gig economy or you just want to plan you're happy with, you can call right now. You'll get a price within two minutes. So see what you can say. This is a very, very smart use of two minutes. Here's the number you need. Call 877-64-BIBLE. That's 877-64-BIBLE. 877-64-BIBLE. Business owners are starting to think outside the box to find new customers. You can reach millions of engaged Catholic listeners by underwriting The Sunrise Morning Show. Each weekday morning, listeners across the U.S. and around the globe can hear your message for your business, ministry, or nonprofit on The Sunrise Morning Show. To find out how it works, email me, Leah, at sacredheartradio.com. That's Leah at sacredheartradio.com. Hi, this is Mike Aquilino with a few words about St. Irenaeus. It's only recently that Pope Francis has declared him to be a doctor of the church. And this is unusual because he's been dead for many centuries, almost two millennia. But I think he's a man for our time because he's teaching us to think, to have an educated faith, to know the reasons for what we believe and then present those to a skeptical world. 18 minutes past the hour. Here's Anna with headlines. The U.S. has said it would not support a potential Israeli attack in the Gaza city of Rafah, a major entry point for humanitarian aid in Gaza. Pope Francis spoke yesterday to members of the Dicastery for Divine Worship and Discipline of the Sacraments about the reform of the liturgy. And yesterday... The Vatican released the Pope's message for the World Day of Prayer and Awareness Against Human Trafficking. 
news at the top and bottom of each hour every weekday morning here on the Sunrise Morning Show. And Anna Mitchell, there's all kinds of great reasons to uh, check out sunrisemorningshow.com and head over to our Facebook page and YouTube channel and the rest. But one is that since we're he- heading into so- Super Bowl weekend, mm-hmm. uh, we posted a video at the Coming Home Network that I posted on our Facebook page as well with a guy named Santonio Hill, uh, who is awesome, and his Journey Home episode's coming up soon. Uh, but he talks about how he went from worshiping football to worshiping God. Uh, I won't spoil the whole story, but I will say that he was a, a extremely talented high school football player, got a Division One scholarship, and uh, had just accepted it. And after Mass, his pastor's like, oh, that's cool. Uh, you know, uh, let me know if you ever think about going to seminary. And that night, Santonio had some weird dreams. <laughs> and the oh, next thing funny. you know, he ends up in seminary. He discerned out uh, and now works at a women's shelter in Pittsburgh, a life-affirming women's shelter. Wow. But he's got a wild story, and it's great perspective for anybody for whom the Super Bowl has become a bit of a golden calf. You think the Super Bowl's become a golden calf? Well, not really? to me. Not to me, mm. Anna Mitchell. Hmm. But it is a good, uh, it's a good little perspective. Yeah. Good little perspective. Absolutely. Can you imagine, though, getting a Division One scholarship and then being like, yeah, you know what? I will try seminary. That's pretty awesome. That's pretty crazy. But again, you can find it linked at sunrisemorningshow.com. We'll give you some info, by the way, next hour on how you can tell everyone you know to switch over to Catholic Radio for Lent. We got some stuff you can download and share to help get that message out here. I'll tell you about it later. It's 21 Past. I'm Father Rob Jack. Join me this afternoon for Driving Home the Faith when Father John Hallowell will share his thoughts on the upcoming E6 Catholic Men's Conference. Mary Clark will talk about the semi-annual 40 Days for Life devotion. I'll talk about the readings for the sixth Sunday of Ordinary Time, the frequent traffic and weather to get you home safely. That's this afternoon beginning at 4 on Sacred Heart Radio. You're on the road. I'm Emily Mackey, inviting you to an inspiring event for the pro-life community, a pro-life gathering for her. I'll be there to discuss theology of the body. Joining me will be pro-life advocate Rebecca Hagan and Donna Murphy of Heaven's Gain Ministries. The day includes mass, confession, and lunch. It's Saturday, February 24th at St. Susanna Church in Mason, brought to you by Cincinnati and Dayton Right to Life. For tickets, CincinnatiRightToLife.org. That's CincinnatiRightToLife.org. Ken Herbert Plumbing is a proud supporter of Sacred Heart Radio. With over 20 years experience in residential and commercial plumbing service repairs and rated A-plus from the BBB, Ken Herbert Plumbing, 513-383-2974. 513-383-2974. Offering Catholic retreats based on Ignatian spirituality, the Jesuit Spiritual Center invites you to a weekend of prayer and renewal As you begin a new year, take time to slow down, refocus, and experience the peace of Christ that surpasses all understanding. Register now at JesuitSpiritualCenter.com. JesuitSpiritualCenter.com. That's JesuitSpiritualCenter.com. JesuitSpiritualCenter.com. Support for Sacred Art Radio is from Molly Maid of Westchester. With 30 years of trusted, quality service and a 100% satisfaction guarantee. 1 800 Molly Made or at MollyMade.com. Molly Made, a clean you can trust. It's always great to catch up each week with Rita Heikenfeld from AboutEating.com to discuss Bible foods. Sometimes we look at various herbs and foods and other things in the Bible uh, and you know, how they can kind of work into conversations today, but sometimes we just talk about eating and food from a Catholic perspective. Rita, good morning. Well, good morning. And you know what, Matt, um, the two casserole recipes I'm going to share, uh, last, uh, last week we talked about healthy drinks when you're not feeling so great. Then I got a couple emails, what about um, casseroles that, we can, that are easy to make that we can share, like take to some, a family who's not well? And I thought, you know what, these both, the Italian sausage and ravioli casserole and one of my favorites, the tater tot casserole, both contain uh, Bible ingredients like garlic and onions, uh, cheese and all that, but um, just perfect. They're not fancy, and 
Paul was saying, oh, boy, they look so good. And I'm so happy because sometimes this is what you need. It is certainly the case. And, you know, I was thinking about the various situations that a person might be in that we as their parish community, uh, you know, might want to build a meal train. You know, there there are people who mm-hmm. have these things already kind of in place, like bereavement committees have these things in place, um, you know, and there are others, right? Because, you know, sometimes there are people who have just had like, I mean, you, if you got knee surgery, you can't just get up and go make something in the kitchen, right? Or if you just had a new baby, that's your full focus. Um, or if you're recovering from COVID or something, uh, I mean, it's important for us as a parish community to take care of the people who are in the family of God with us. Oh, yeah. And the best thing about these two is you, you can double up and make one for yourself and then freeze it. So um, I'm not sure which is your favorite. So you choose which one we're going to talk about first. All right, so before I launch into which one is my favorite, I want to just mention that in the corporal and spiritual works of mercy, we are told as Catholics that we're supposed to feed the hungry, Mm -hmm. give water to the thirsty, visit the sick, visit the imprisoned. Sometimes when you're (laughs) you're homebound, it feels like that, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, And in the spiritual works of mercy, right, we are to comfort the afflicted. So that's five you can knock off of your list just by making these meals and helping somebody out but tell me rita about the tater tot casserole oh i knew you were going to choose that first you know um i did not grow up with tater tots and and they really weren't something in my life really? and well then you didn't I go know. to public school in the 1980s like i did i did not um but boy oh boy when my kids would come home from school and they said they had this casserole at like billy's house and it had tater tots and then boy i was i was introduced to a whole new world anyway this is a wonderful recipe, really easy and loved by kids. You're just going to take um, some olive oil and just film a skillet. First of all, you're going to just spray a 9 by 13 casserole. And then you're going to add some onions and ground beef um, to that skillet and then just cook that till the beef is done. And then um, you're just going to put the beef and onions in a bowl. And then you're just going to add some garlic salt, some sour cream, um, condensed cream of chicken soup, some cheddar cheese, and some milk. Stir all that up. It's not going to look beautiful, but it's going to be good. And then add salt and pepper if you want. And then what you do, you just sort of pour that all into a casserole, and then you top it with some tater tops. And um, I'll have all the specifics on my website. You just bake that mat about 45 minutes. So good. And then if you like extra crispy tater tots, one of our listeners said, just leave the whole thing under the broiler for a, a few minutes. So um, you can't go wrong with this tater tot casserole, and it can be frozen um, before or after. So just a wonderful one that's going to make um, some pe- uh, somebody not feeling the greatest or um, under the weather doesn't feel like cooking supper for the family. It's perfect. Oh, man, it sounds amazing. And, uh, you know, you mentioned it doesn't look beautiful at the, sp- uh, at the start, but I will say, like, if you put the tater tots on and you do that broiler at their end and you get, like, the golden brown on the tater mm-hmm. tots, it, it does – the presentation is nice. Yeah, it's like yeah. A, an inverted uh, low-key shepherd's pie variation almost. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's great. But I want to talk about this ravioli recipe, too. Uh, there's a – well, it's not just merely ravioli. It's a ravioli casserole. Yeah, and, you know, a lot of uh, people think of lasagna to take uh, two families, and that takes some work. Well, this is sort of tastes like lasagna, but it's so much easier what you're going to do is you're going to take some, uh, just a roll of Italian sausage, either mild or hot, um, some onion and some garlic, and you're just going to cook that in a skillet till the sausage is done. And then you're going to stir in some pasta sauce, um, you know, just the jar. Now, I like plain marinara, um, and I, what would you like in there? Do you like the plain marinara or do you like the ones with veggies and all that? I'd rather go plain and then modify to my specs. There you go. You could put some veggies in there. Well, so basically, if you stir in the pasta sauce, um, you're going to just spray a 9 by 13 pan again, and you're going to spread a cup of that sausage mixture on the bottom, and then you're going to take a bag of cheese ravioli, about 24 ounces or so. It's frozen, and you're going to just dump half of that on top, spread that, Then you're going to sprinkle it with some Italian cheese or even just mozzarella. Um, And then you're going to top it with the rest of the ravioli, the rest of the sausage mixture, and the rest of the cheese. And you're just going to cover that with foil and bake about 45 minutes or so 
just till it's thoroughly heated, and then um, the ravioli will be done. And then you remove the foil, and then you need to bake it until the cheese melts a little bit. Yeah. Let it sit a few minutes before serving. It's like lasagna, but so much easier to serve and to eat. Very good. Well, Rita, you've told me before that when it comes to somebody who's in this sort of situation, you have a whole bunch of tips, you know, about how to deliver things. But there are three that have always stuck with me. One, make something that works really well as leftovers. Yeah. As easy leftovers. Yeah. Uh, bring it all in disposable containers so nobody mm -hmm. has to wash dishes or return anything to you. And number three, don't hang around and chat for two hours. If somebody's not feeling great, <laughs> drop it off and uh, let them be in rest. That's so. right. That's probably one of the most important. Yes, especially if they got a sleeping newborn in the house. Mm -hmm. Rita Heikenfeld, <laughs> we've got your recipes in the show notes today at SunriseMorningShow.com. Have a great day. I will, Matt, and I'll talk to you next week. Half past the hour, here's Anna with news. Good morning. The U.S. says it does not support a potential Israeli attack in the Gaza city of Rafah, the city in the southern end of the Gaza Strip is packed with more than a million Palestinians, many of them refugees in the war between Israel and Hamas. A State Department spokesman yesterday said an Israeli ground operation in the city would be a, quote, disaster, and Washington has yet to see any evidence of serious planning for such an attack. Rafa is a major entry point for humanitarian aid in Gaza. A bill to provide aid to Israel as well as Ukraine and Taiwan is moving forward in the Senate. Mark Mayfield reports. The Senate voted in favor of advancing the foreign aid package on Thursday after Republicans in the chamber rejected a broader bill including border policy changes. The 67 to 32 vote means that the Senate can begin consideration of the $95 billion package. It's still unclear if the aid package can ultimately make it through Congress. I'm Mark Mayfield. Former President Trump has won the Republican caucuses in Nevada. Yesterday evening, Trump won in a landslide just hours after he also secured a, vi a victory in the U.S. Virgin Island caucuses. Trump didn't face any major competition, though, in Nevada's GOP opponent Nikki Haley chose to compete in Nevada's primary on Tuesday. Trump claimed all 26 of Nevada's GOP delegates, moving him a step closer to the Republican presidential nomination. President Biden yesterday praised a special counsel's decision to not file charges against him for retaining classified documents. The counsel's report laid out some differences between Biden and Donald Trump's handling of classified materials, noting that Biden voluntarily returned the documents and cooperated with the investigation, while Trump now faces an indictment for allegedly obstructing the government's efforts to retrieve the classified material. Trump, for his part, says the lack of charges in Biden's case is, quote, selective prosecution. The Vatican yesterday released the Pope's message for the World Day of Prayer and Awareness Against Human Trafficking for the Feast of St. Josephine Bakita. From Vatican Radio, Deborah Castellano-Luboff reports. I associate myself wholeheartedly with all of you around the world, especially the young who are working to combat this global scourge. As he repeated, it is never too late to take action. The church's theme for this year's day is journeying in dignity. Listen, dream, act. In his message, the Pope urged everyone to walk in the footsteps of St. Josephine Bakita, who was trafficked herself as a child. He said St. Bakita encourages us to open our eyes and ears to see those who go unseen and to hear those who have no voice to acknowledge the dignity of each person and to fight trafficking and all forms of exploitation. Lamenting that trafficking often goes unseen, the Pope urged, let us help one another to be more responsive. The Pope appealed for listening to suffering victims. May we listen to their cry for help and feel challenged by the stories they tell, he said. The Holy Father encouraged all efforts that better enable people to live with freedom and dignity and called for taking concrete actions to combat trafficking. At each and every level, he exhorted, let us pray fervently and work proactively for this cause. While we know the fight against trafficking can be won, he suggested, it is necessary to get to the root of the problem and eliminate its causes. The Pope went on to encourage all efforts to respond to the phenomenon following St. Paquita's example. It is a call to action, to mobilize all our resources. He warned, if we close our eyes and ears, if we do nothing, we will be guilty of complicity. 
Pope Francis concluded by expressing his heartfelt gratitude to everyone engaged in the celebration of this day and blessing all committed to combating trafficking and all forms of exploitation. I'm Deborah Castellana Lubov. Yesterday, executives at Johnson and Johnson, Merck, and Bristol Myers Squibb were summoned in front of the Senate Health Committee and were confronted about American drug prices. They conceded patients in the United States are paying too much, but placed blame on pharmacy benefit managers. The Department of Health and Human Services found in 2022 that even when taking into account the discounts Americans receive from health plans and employers pay, still people pay on average at least three times as much. That's the news. You're listening to the Sunrise Morning Show. It's 35 past the hour. The sunrise. I am Father Ronald Haft, chaplain for the Cincinnati Chapter of Courage. Courage is for those who have same-sex attractions but want to remain close to Christ and His Church. For information, contact me at courage at catholicaoc.org. Support for Sacred Heart Radio is from Schneller Knockelman Plumbing, Heating, and Air, treating customers with integrity for over 90 years for heating, air conditioning, water heaters, plumbing, and more. Schneller Knockelman at skpha.com. SKPHA.com. Why wait in endless lines at the pharmacy when Brozard Pharmacy, a proud supporter of Sacred Heart Radio, can fill your prescriptions in a timely manner with high quality. Brozard Pharmacy, fast, friendly service without the wait. 513-941-0428. Support for Sacred Heart Radio is from Hoting Realtors. Equipped with the latest technology and market knowledge, Hoting Realtors can make the buying and selling process easier. 513 513- 451 and Hoting.com. It's 24 minutes before the hour on this Friday, February the 9th. Your forecast is brought to you on Sacred Heart Catholic Radio by Schneller Knockman Plumbing, Heating, and Air online at skpha.com. Getting even warmer today, and it's rather warm outside right now with temperatures in the lower 50s as you're heading out the door. For Cincinnati, mostly cloudy skies today, an isolated evening rain chance and a high of 62. Some scattered showers and a few downpours possible tonight with an overnight low of 54. Rain ends early tomorrow, then it'll be mostly cloudy and mild with a high of 60 degrees. For the Miami Valley Dayton area, cloudy early, then partly cloudy this afternoon with a high of 62. Increasing clouds with showers late tonight and an overnight low of 50. Rain showers early, then decreasing clouds later in the day, and high tomorrow of 57 degrees. This is Sacred Heart Catholic Radio. It's 37 minutes past the hour. You're listening to the Sunrise Morning Show on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Good morning. Happy Friday. Sunrise Morning Show legal, political, and sometimes cultural and moral analyst Ken Craycraft joining us now on the Sunrise Morning Show. He's a professor at Mount St. Mary's Seminary, writes for the Catholic Telegraph and our Sunday Visitor, among other publications. Good morning, Ken. Good morning, Annie. Nice to be back with you. It is nice to have you back. And this year marks the 75th anniversary of the play Death of a Salesman. And I know you just reread and rewatched it. You have a column over at OSV that I encourage folks to look at. Good uh, food for thought as we uh, begin to enter into the Lenten season. Now, there are those who think that the main character, Willie Loman's downfall, is simply due to oppressive American capitalism. And others say, no, it was really his own greed that brought about his downfall. What say you, Ken? Yeah, you know, it's interesting, just as a, an aside or perhaps a supplement, uh, your, your two suggested interpretations, which, you know, I agree with. Um, there, there's, a, uh, there's a wonderful TV, uh, made-for-TV production uh, starring Dustin Hoffman as Willie and John Malkovich as Biff Lohman, two, the two main characters mm-hmm. and the, the two antagonists. And Arthur Miller, and there is a, 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 a companion video uh, of the making of the, of the TV play, which is really good. And Arthur Miller was always there, and it was interspersed with interviews by Arthur Miller, the playwright. And he said, it's funny, he said that um, 
that could be a possible interpretation, but he didn't say that that was his interpretation, mm. sort of letting the play speak for itself. And, and certainly I you know, agree with Miller, the playwright, <laughs> uh, that that's a possible interpretation. But I think that, that the death of a salesman is about much more than capitalism or, and much more than Willie Loman's greed, and, and therefore is a much more profound play. For me, the play is about Willie's deceit and self-deception and his pride, but much more basic problems than than capital than any economic system, or or even the greed uh, that he sometimes is accused of having. It was his self deception and his deceit, um, because much of his life was built around deceiving others and deceiving himself. And of course, one of the most central plot line, at least as it concerns the tension or the conflict with his son Biff is a grand deception against his wife, who otherwise is as faithful as any wife that you'll ever see in, in any literature, in any, any play or any book. Um, so I think it was Willie's pride that killed him. I think it was his deception that killed him. And you see this pride and deception and deceit throughout the uh, play as you see these little asides where Willie is inventing a past that probably didn't exist in order to try to justify his present. And as I as I read that play for the you know again it was the it's the 75th anniversary this month of February of the Broadway production, I, I thought of, I thought about Lent coming up and I thought about our own pride and our own self deceit and our own self deception and the way that Lent is supposed to be a cleansing of all of those things because self deception has can take a hold of us and it can create a whole network of of false relationships. Uh, with people around us, and that really is the key, I think, to the to the death of a salesman. Willie was false to himself and about himself, and in order to sustain his own self deceit, he created this web of self deception. And virtually every conversation, every piece of dialogue with his sons, Happy and Biff, are examples of that self deception because the uh, the apples, as they say, didn't fall far from the tree, and Biff. And Willie, or, and Biff and Happy, rather, Willie's two sons are just as much engaged in the self-deception as he is. And and of course, the tray is a, the play is a classic tragic play in the American tradition, and it's all built around that self-deception and deceit and those webs of self-deception that Willie built and that which his sons participated in. Well, but for the grace of God, go I, right? I mean, the, this is the That's story right. of the human condition. That's exactly right. And as I say in the column at, at our Sunday Visitor, which is also, this is actually my syndicated column with OSV News, Annie, so it's actually available other places, including, for example, oh, nice. Catholic Review yeah. in the Dar Diocese of Baltimore. Um, so, yeah, the, the observation, this, this, this uh, web of self-deceit is, is, is as old as Genesis chapter 3, isn't it, Annie? Mm -hmm. If you look at the, the story of the fall, the serpent tempting the woman and the woman tempting the man, and, and, and this web of illusion that was created by the serpent and by the woman, when the serpent said to the woman, uh, is it true that you can't eat from any tree in the garden? And she said, so that's the beginning of the deception. And then she says, well, we can eat from any tree except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And in that tree, she says, we cannot even touch. Again, there's some self-deception there and, and a, the beginning of a web, uh, as you might call it, of illusion. And then she drew the man into it. And as they say, the rest is history. And I think this, uh, uh, this the self-deception in the Garden of Eden is very much at play, I think, in Death of a Salesman, because you have these, these layers of deception and layers of hiding. And of course, then the man and the woman in Genesis 3 tried to hide from God. And Willie tries to hide from himself, and he tries to hide mm -hmm. from his actual present, present that is the present day, by by these uh, these uh, almost psychotic uh, visions of some invented past uh, in the future, and then always talking about some or um, some invented past, and then always talking about some future that we know watching the play is never going to happen. Yeah. Well, you know, some people might read death of a salesman and and want to point the finger at some outside force right that yeah, yeah. um that that it did this to willie or they might look at yes. the play and say okay well this is you know a really tragic story of of this man's downfall but i don't see any of myself in willie loman i'm not going to go out and 
and uh, <laughs> deliberately crash my car to kill myself. Um, so yeah. how would you encourage folks to, I mean, as you were saying, this is what land is all about, right? To, to, to yep. kind of pull back the curtain a little bit on our own lives and, and find those, those dark areas where we're deceiving ourselves. What can, what should we be looking for in our own lives that Willie Loman yeah. might help us uncover? Oh, Oh, Annie, that's such a great question. And I think the one word is transparency and vulnerability. Mm. Uh, Willie, and, and as I say in the piece, Willie tried to, as we say now, control the narrative. And we find ourselves wanting to control the narrative. And when we do that, what are we really doing? We're trying to put up a shield around ourselves. I think that one of the things that we can learn from the play, especially as we approach Lent, is, is self-transparency is, is self and vulnerability, recognizing that we have to be transparent to the other in order for the other to know who we are. And, and we're social beings, Annie. We know ourselves because of the other and through the other. Well, if the other or me is false, if I am not transparent, if I'm, if I'm opaque and if I'm not open and vulnerable to the other, then I'm not just harming myself, I'm harming the other as well. And that's the way that we try to, quote, control the narrative, which Willie was constantly trying to do in the play. And what it tells us is that we don't think of transparency and vulnerability often as virtues, but they really are. And they're virtues because they help us to develop the skills to be better moral persons. And I think that really is the message of the play, because it, I don't think it was any outside force that killed Willie. I think Willie killed himself by his own lack of transparency, his own refusal to be vulnerable to those around him, which led to these webs of deceit and this, this attempt to control the narrative. Annie, we are not in control. That's what the play tells us. We are not in control. And our attempts to assert control when we are not in control leads to tragedy. And so this Lent is a time of giving up our illusion of control, our illusion of deceit, our self-deception that we are in control to be transparent to God and to be transparent to one another. And that's where true repentance is found. And that's where true contrition is found as well. And you just don't see that in Willie and you don't see it in his sons. It is, I, I don't remember the last time I thought about death of a salesman, Ken, but this is, this is such a great conversation to be having right at this moment in, in the, the liturgical cycle here in the church. And folks, if you want to read more about it, you can find it at our sundayvisitor.com. And like Ken said, uh, perhaps in your local Catholic publication as well. And you can find our Sunday visitor linked at sunrisemorningshow.com. Ken, thank you. Thank you, Annie. Have a great day. You too. Thank you very much. All right. Father Hezekiah Carnazzo joins us next. It's 13 till. Support is from Solidarity Health Share. Do you have an insurance plan that pays for everything, even things that violate your beliefs? Have you ever felt there has to be a better way, but didn't know you had any options? If you answered yes, I've got some good news for you. There is a better way and a more affordable way. Solidarity HealthShare can save you hundreds of dollars each month while actually supporting your beliefs. Because the best news is that Solidarity HealthShare costs a whole lot less than insurance. It's time to jump in and put your money where your faith is and put some money back into your wallet at the same time. Join Solidarity HealthShare, a faith-based healthcare sharing community. Prices start as low as $384 a month for families. Call to see how much you can save, 844-334-3245. That's 844-334-3245. Solidarity Health Share, 844-334-3245. If the cold winter mornings make you want to stay in bed, it's time to get some Mystic Monk coffee or tea to help make kicking off the covers a little easier. And when you head to their site by clicking the link at sunrisemorningshow.com, you earn us a commission on your purchase without spending anything extra. While you're at our site, be sure to check out our online store where you can buy Sunrise Morning Show mugs and travel mugs. Get a mug and link to Mystic Monk Coffee at sonrisemorningshow.com. That's sunrisemorningshow.com. 
EWTN Radio is seeking a dynamic radio producer to join the EWTN Radio team in Irondale, Alabama. The right candidate will be a passionate, multi-skilled, talented professional who can manage and direct all aspects of producing world-class radio broadcasts and play an integral part in Mother Angelica's mission. If this is you or someone you know, email a resume and cover letter including salary requirements to humanresources at EWTN.com. Back with us now on the Sunrise Morning Show is Father Hezekiah Carnazzo from the Institute of Catholic Culture. Good morning, Father. Good morning, Annie. It's a blessing to be with you and your listeners today. It is a blessing to have you back. And certainly leprosy standing out in the readings for this weekend on the sixth Sunday in Ordinary Time, the uh, final Sunday of Ordinary Time before we enter into Lent. So the first reading is from Leviticus chapter 13, and then the gospel reading is uh, from the gospel of Mark chapter 1. But um, in the first reading, we have the Lord telling Moses and Aaron about the uncleanliness of those who suffer from leprosy. And then, of course, we have the leper coming to Jesus in the gospel of Mark, asking to be made clean. So can you explain this whole thing about cleanliness in the Levitical law? Sure, it's a very striking passage because it it says that a one who is confirmed to have leprosy is sent out of the gathering of God's people out in the desert, right? They're to stand outside the community. They can't enter in to the gathering of God's people, and they have to stay out there for a certain amount of time, and they have to walk around. This is the, the hard part for us to hear, yelling out, unclean, unclean, mm-hmm. right? And, and there's a clear association here between the state of the person's physical health and their spiritual health. And this is what, for us in, say, modern society is hard to hear, right? How is it possible that one who is physically ill is so because somehow they've done something wrong? And, and here's what I think we need to remember as we're looking at this. All of us bear the mark of sin. All of us live in a fallen world. And illness and suffering is a part of that, not because of some personal guilt of the one who is sick, but rather because we are the inheritors of a human nature which is fallen. This Sunday is is the the Sunday before Lent. That is, yeah. it is the Gateway Sunday, and it and the Church in her wisdom now calls us to the realization that all of us, all of us, are leprous before God. All of us are fallen, um, regardless of our, the personal sins that we have engaged in, but all of us are inheritors of a fallen human nature and therefore stand in need of the mercy and healing of God in body and soul. And, and, and this calling out unclean, unclean by the leper is a calling for all of us to holy confession, a call out before God to lay bare before Him the realization of the state of our life and to ask them for healing. And through that entrance again into the worshiping community, to the worshiping community, the Church, the Church of the Old Testament, the Church of the New Testament, is is lived in the image and likeness of the eternal Church, which is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That is the communion we are called into in the Church. And when we fall sick, when we find ourselves, in a sense, leprous before God, we, we remember that nothing unclean will enter into the presence of God, and therefore we call to the Lord who now is our Savior and our healer. Such a beautiful point, because I wanted to ask you about the words of the leper here in Mark chapter 1. This is verses 40 through 45, and it begins by saying, A leper came to Jesus and kneeling down, begged him and said, If you wish, you can make me clean. And Jesus is moved with pity, stretches out his hand, touches him, and says to him, I will do it, be made clean. It wasn't like, if you can, if you will it, you can heal me. If you will it, you can take away this disease. And no, he says to be made clean. Do you think yeah. that's significant? It, yeah, because, because you have to realize that the leper is not only um, an outcast from society, he is an outcast from the worshiping community. He's not able to enter into the synagogue and ultimately the temple in Jerusalem. He's not able to do what he's made to do. 
And this is the beauty of Jesus' ministry. This is what he comes for. He comes as the Messiah, the one who is the king of his kingdom. And he goes about now in his ministry seeing all the parts of his kingdom that are out of order, and he puts them in their proper order. And ultimately, the problem with mankind is a problem which began in the beginning when our first parents refused to worship our Heavenly Father. And the leper now stands as a representative of this one who is unable to worship the Lord in the fullness of the gathering of God's people in the image and likeness of that eternal gathering. And so the leper, in being cleansed by Christ, is, is, is brought back into this relationship with God. Again, not because of a personal sin, necessarily, but because all of us have the mark of fallen human nature. And notice what Jesus does now. He doesn't do as, as maybe some Jewish healer would have done, right, observant of the law, stand back and say, be clean. No. He stretches forth his hand. And in this moment, there's, I believe there's a mo- this is a moment of the incarnation, right? Yes, Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. There's the incarnation of God in the flesh. But in this moment, he becomes incarnate as the healer of this man. And instead of simply speaking, he stretches forth his hand and touches him, crossing in that moment, crossing the, the threshold between heaven and earth, touching him. He brings what only God can bring, and that is the gift of eternal life and the restoration of this man. This is given to us now, this, this moment as an icon for us to call out to the Lord, make us clean, prepare us now for our, our entrance back into the, into the fullness of the life of the Holy Trinity. And that process begins now, the process that will, be, that will continue throughout our Lenten journey until we enjoy the light of the resurrection. Which is exactly what we see in the responsorial psalm that I would love to close with these verses from Psalm 32, Father. Uh, The response, I turn to you, Lord, in time of trouble, and you fill me with the joy of salvation. Yeah, listen, listen to these words. Blessed is he whose fault is taken away, whose sin is covered. And then, but, but, but now notice where it goes. Then I acknowledge my sin to you, my guilt I cover not, unless we lay ourselves bare before the Lord, unless we cry out to Him to be healed, unless we're willing to go to confession, then He, as our, as our healer, will never force Himself upon us. So we lay ourselves before the Lord and say, Heal me, Lord, here, now, in this way, and restore me to the, to the love of the Most Holy Trinity. And we know the Lord is generous, as we see in this story with the leper, and we know he is quite generous with his mercy in the confessional if we go to him to receive it. We've been talking to Father Hezekiah Carnazzo. And, Father, I know there's a Lenten retreat coming up next week at the ICC. Yeah, come check it out. Lenten retreat with um, Monsignor Charles Fultz at the Institute of Catholic Culture. So come check us out, instituteofcatholicculture.org. We begin our retreat on Ash Wednesday. Uh, we'll be with Monsignor Folk for the following days. So come check it out, instituteofcatholicculture.org. Linked at sunrisemorningshow.com. Thank you, Father. We got another hour for most of our affiliates here on EWTN Radio. Family, with Lent starting soon, you'll hear a lot about what you should give up and give away. But here's something that will cost you nothing. Tell someone about Sacred Heart Catholic Radio. By providing them with this wealth of knowledge to grow in their faith is how we expand our family of listeners and add new donors. We need the support of many new listeners right now to bring the good news of our salvation through Jesus Christ to everyone on every media device. So today, give away Sacred Heart Radio and the Sacred Heart Radio app. Support for Sacred Heart Radio is from Twin Dental of Cincinnati. Since 1986, twin brothers, Drs. David and Michael Rothen have been providing superior dental care in a relaxed and comfortable setting for the entire family. The twin dental doctors utilize advanced dentistry techniques from sedation to implants and the latest in cosmetic options to preserve and beautify smiles. Twin Dental, located just off the I-275 exit at Hamilton Avenue. For a complimentary evaluation, 513-825-6111 and online at twindental.com. Proud supporter of Sacred Heart Radio, Cincinnati Right to Life ensures that God-given rights are guaranteed for all simply by being human, regardless of age or stage, ability or disability. More information at 1-800-712-HELP. The Cincinnati Chapter of Legatus is a national network of Catholic business owners, CEOs, and managing partners facing the challenges of faith, family, and business each day. 
We meet once a month with our spouse for a mass, dinner, and speaker. We have the support of the Archdiocese of Cincinnati and many members throughout the parishes, including yours. We would appreciate the chance to share what we are about with you and enjoy Mass together soon. Contact us at Cincinnati at Legatus.org. That's Cincinnati at Legatus.org. Support is from MediShare. Let's see, if something costs less, but people are happier with it, that sounds like something to look into, and that is MediShare. Maybe you've heard switching to MediShare to pay for health care can save many families up to 500 bucks a month, and that is huge. But it's also true that people are way more satisfied after making the switch, too. The member satisfaction rate for MediShare is double that of the typical health insurance plan double. MediShare works too. It's been around for 30 years. Members have shared more than $5 billion of each other's bills. People love having telehealth and a huge nationwide PPO network. So yeah, really, you can save a ton and like it better. Imagine being happy with how you're taking care of your health care. So if you're self-employed or part of the gig economy, or you just want to plan you're happy with. You can call right now. You'll get a price within two minutes. So see what you can say. This is a very, very smart use of two minutes. Here's the number you need. Call 877-64-BIBLE. That's 877-64-BIBLE. 877-64-BIBLE. This is Archbishop Dennis Schnur from the Archdiocese of Cincinnati. Thank you for listening to Sacred Heart Catholic Radio. 740 WNOP Newport, 910 WPFB Middletown, or get the app, stream, podcast, and more at sacredheartradio.com. Arise, it's a new day. Hear his word, let us pray. The sunrise morning show. Friday, the 9th of February. Let's begin together in prayer, praying uh, a prayer written by Pope John Paul II in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. O God, you are our creator. You are good and your mercy knows no bounds. To you arises the praise of every creature. O God, you have given us an inner law by which we must live. To do your will is our task. To follow your ways is to know peace of heart. To you we offer our homage. Guide us on all the paths we travel upon this earth. Free us from all the evil tendencies which lead our hearts away from your will. Never allow us to stray from you. O God, judge of all humanity, help us to be included among your chosen ones on the last day. O God, author of peace and justice, give us true joy and authentic love and a lasting solidarity among peoples. Give us your everlasting gifts. Amen. It is a better way to start a Friday morning, the Sunrise Morning Show, here on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. I'm Matt Swaim. Anna Mitchell has news. Paul Lockman has sports. Travis, no, not that Travis, has our video feed up and running so you can see us. I know everybody wants to watch the Super Bowl this weekend, but does anybody want to watch the Sunrise Morning Show this morning? I mean, this is the real. We're bringing in all the heavy hitters today. Some of those heavy hitters are names you may recognize, such as Father Frank Donio from the Catholic Apostolate Center, and uh, we'll also check in with Dr. Jeffrey Morrow as we continue our series uh, on A Catholic Guide to the Old Testament, looking at the Book of Lamentations today, appropriate as we head into Lent next week. We'll also catch up with Bobby Schindler from the Life and Hope Network, and Father Jonathan Duncan will preview Sunday's Mass readings, so do stay with us if you can. Two minutes past, news of service of Central Fabricators and centralfabricators.com. Here's Anna Mitchell. Good morning. The U.S. says it does not support a potential Israeli attack in the Gaza city of Rafah. In the city in the southern end of the Gaza Strip is packed with more than a million Palestinians, many of them refugees in the war between Israel and Hamas. A State Department spokesman yesterday said an Israeli ground operation in the city would be a, quote, disaster and Washington Has yet to see any evidence of serious planning for the attack, though. Rafa is a major entry point for humanitarian aid in Gaza. Meanwhile, a bill to provide aid to Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan is moving forward in the Senate. Mark Mayfield has the story. The Senate voted in favor of advancing the foreign aid package on Thursday after Republicans in the chamber rejected a broader bill including border policy changes. The 67 to 32 vote means that the Senate can begin consideration of the $95 billion package. It's still unclear if the aid package can ultimately make it through Congress. 
I'm Mark Mayfield. Former President Trump has won the Republican caucuses in Nevada on Thursday evening. Trump won in a landslide just hours after he also secured a victory in the U.S. Virgin Islands caucuses. Trump didn't face any major competition in Nevada, though, because GOP opponent Nikki Haley chose to compete in the state primary on Tuesday. So Trump claimed all 26 of Nevada's GOP delegates, moving him a step closer to snagging the presidential nomination. Pope Francis met yesterday with members of the Dicastery for Divine Worship and Discipline of the Sacraments, speaking about the reform of the liturgy. From Vatican Radio, Francesca Merlo reports. Pope Francis opened his discourse by noting that even 60 years after the promulgation of the Sacrosanctum Concilium, it is still highly relevant as it contains a precise will to reform the Church in its fundamental dimensions. The Pope noted that it is a profound work of spiritual, pastoral, ecumenical and missionary renewal and that without a liturgical reform, there is no reform of the Church. In the spirit of synodal collaboration between the dicasteries, Pope Francis expressed his desire that the question of liturgical formation of ordained ministers be handled together with the Dicastery for Culture and Education, with the Dicastery for the Clergy, and with the Dicastery for Institutes of Consecrated Life and Societies of Apostolic Life, so that each one may offer its own specific contribution. It is necessary to ensure that the formation of ordained ministers also increasingly has a liturgical sapiential imprint, the Pope said, both in the curriculum of theological studies and in the life experience of seminaries. Bringing his discourse to a close, Pope Francis stressed that as we prepare new formation paths for ministers, we must at the same time think of those intended for the people of God. The first concrete opportunities for liturgical formation, the Holy Father noted, are Sundays and the feast days celebrated throughout the liturgical year. Finally, Pope Francis Francis reminded those present that their task is great and beautiful. And for this, he concludes, I thank you so much and I bless you from my heart. I am Francesca Merlo. And the medals for the Paris 2024 Olympics will include a small piece of iron from the Eiffel Tower. The country is including the hexagonal piece to mark 100 years since Paris last hosted the Olympic Games. The iron chunks from pieces removed from the iconic tower over various renovations in the past last century. The organization that oversees the Eiffel Tower donated them to the Paris Olympic Committee. I guess that's not enough to, like, damage the structure. Yeah, that's interesting. But did you know, like, Catholics are super weird for being into relics? Yeah, so here we go. What an interesting relic. Yeah. yeah hmm. That's essentially what you're looking at here. Hmm. Hmm. I didn't even think about it that way, Who Matt. knew? Who knew? Who knew? Yeah, but humans Catholics have a thing for relics. for relics. I think humans have a thing for relics. We are integrated. Mm-hmm. Stuff matters. Matter mm-hmm. matters, Anna Mitchell. Matter matters. Matter matters, Matt. Matt, matter matters. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know what else to say. I've been... I've, I haven't heard my name that many times in 10 seconds in a long time. Yeah. Except for maybe from my son when he wants to get me. Does he call you Matt? No, he does not. Roma's taken to calling Will Uncle Will. I'm not really sure what that's that's about. That's not his name. His name is Dad. Yeah. There you go. Did I say Roma? I meant Agnes. In any event. (laughs) Agnes has an excuse. Roma does not. The baby. The baby. The baby. The baby. It's obviously probably confused. I... I am doing a terrible job at keeping my kids' names straight. It's, it's a problem. It's seven past. It's time for our weekly Old Testament Bible study. We've been using a Catholic guide to the Old Testament from Ascension Press. You can get your own copy at ascensionpress.com slash Old Testament. And we are back with one of the contributors, Dr. Jeffrey Morrow. Good morning, Dr. Morrow. Good morning. It's wonderful to be here. It is wonderful. Joining us again on the Sunrise Morning Show is Father Frank Donio from the Catholic Apostolate Center. Good morning, Father Frank. Welcome back. Good morning, Anna. It's good to have you. And we are going to be using uh, your segments for the next couple of months, I guess, 
Uh, spending Lent with your founder, St. Vincent Pilati. We did this during Advent, too, and some he had some really beautiful insights that you shared into our celebration of the incarnation and preparing for that that celebration. So I can only imagine that he had some profound insights into the season of Lent as well. Am I right? Very much so. He he had a, a great uh, devotion to the passion of Christ mm. and the uh, the precious blood of Christ. He was he was close friends with Saint uh, uh, Gaspar de Bofalo, the founder of the precious missionaries of precious oh, blood, yeah. and so he he picked up that that devotion from him, but also this sense of uh, of sacrificing oneself. He also was, he was an extremely active man, but he would be in the middle of the night praying and he would kneel before this crucifix, which is still, we, his room is preserved in Rome. And it, it's a kind of, it's a gory crucifix, mm. crucifixion scene, uh, very popular in the 19th century. And, and, but he would meditate on this in the middle of the night, in the quiet, because otherwise his day was just filled with activity and care of people and mm. and reconciling them with the Lord and out in the streets caring for the poor and so that that stepping away was very important and really that's the first thing we're going to focus on which is important for us to do as we head into Lent and that's solitude yeah and and he says for 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus prayed and fasted. He nevertheless condescended to teach us the practice of solitude in order to speak to God alone. Wow. I never really, really thought about he, this, Father, that, I mean, Jesus didn't need to pray in the sense that we need to pray. I mean, he's he's one with the Father yes. and the Holy Spirit, um, and and yet he's he's fully God, of course, and also fully human. And and yes. giving that example to us is wow. It's a tremendous example, and really, the tradition of the forty days of Lent comes from this time that the Lord went out into the desert. Mm -hmm. And we recall he's tempted by Satan. The devil tempts him. Of course, all those temptations are, you know, pushed aside. You know, they, in the scriptures, it says but he was he was there for forty days and forty nights, and he fasted, and then he was hungry. And then he was hungry. Yeah. And and there was that that moment of in the scriptures just to note, you know, he's fully human mm -hmm. as well as fully divine. And. And, and notice how St. Vincent Pillai says, condescended. We, we don't usually like condescension, yeah. but he condescended to teach us the practice of solitude. Because that's the point. In order to speak to God alone, I mean, all of the great spiritual traditions speak about the need for silence and solitude. Why do so many people... Uh, our, our call, uh, feel a, a call to be before the Blessed Sacrament, whether in the tabernacle or in Eucharistic adoration, the monstrance, in a quiet place, in a quiet church, or even in a quiet part, if they can find that, and that's really hard for parents with young kids and all of these, mm -hmm. and, and people's busy lives, but can we find that moment of solitude? It's so difficult. To, to do today yeah well and Lent gives us that opportunity well and and for some of us we're not even trying to find it because we live in in such noise we've gotten so used to the noise that we're we're scared of yeah. solitude father I think that's interesting yes. you use the word condescend because I was, you know, you take that apart, con means with and then descend. So he is down with us. With us, yes. And 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 I was mentioning, of course, he's God. So he's 
one in union with the Father and, and the Holy Spirit. So he wasn't actually alone, so to speak. I mean, it's no. three persons in one God. When we are praying in solitude, we also are not alone, are we? Yes, because who are we speaking to? We're speaking to Christ. We're, 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 we're given that, that ability by the Holy Spirit to speak to God, and Christ is God. And so that, no, we're not alone. And, it, and it, in all of the noise, including you know, the doom scrolling on the phone, <laughs> all of the noise... And it's an interesting term, doom scrolling, because you know we, we 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 put ourselves in this in this weird spot, which re, which takes us away from the focus on God and on others. But but really, at Lent, uh, the time of Lent gives us an opportunity to step back in those forty days and to look at where. Where is our relationship with God? And the only way really to know that is to be in conversation with God alone. No different than, in fact, you know, we, we can't build relationships with people if we're not in dialogue with them, if we're not in conversation with them, if we're not building the relationship. The same, and even more so, is true with God. And that's really what St. Vincent is saying here. Yeah. And the church gives us so much in, you know, some people may say, well, I don't, I don't know how to pray. Um, mm -hmm. Well, you know, I was, I was reading um, uh, Father Garanger, uh, mm -hmm. who, who wrote this huge volume, for those who are not familiar with him, wrote this huge volume of, on, on the liturgical year and liturgical practices. And, and he had this insight about how we should prefer the, prayers of the church over our own prayers, not to say that we should never say our own prayers, but we can pray with the church, and the church gives us that aid so that we can pray. Yes, in, in, in all sorts of ways, yeah. whether it's the, the, the prayer of, uh, of the Lord, you know, the Lord's Prayer, our, our, the Our Father, the Hail Mary, the Glory Be, or the Liturgy of the Hours. Mm-hmm. And, which is the prayer of the church that we can share in, and the beauty of the Psalms that speak to the realities of our relationship with God and with others. But it is in that prayer and also fasting, you know, two of the disciplines of Lent, prayer, fasting, almsgiving, it's, it, it is in those that, that we move away from the things that, that pull us away from, from God. And it's really not that complex. We have this opportunity. We can pray with the, the scriptures of the, the mass of the day. Mm -hmm. We can uh, do different devotional practices, but we also don't want to, you know, to just simply add to the, to the noise, but where is the, the meditation and contemplation? You know, and, and our Christianity... In Catholicism, we have a beautiful tradition of meditative practices, and I don't mean ones that are outside of our tradition, meditative practices and also contemplation, just adoring the Lord, being there and adoring the Lord. That is the, but that can only happen in solitude. Yeah. It can't happen with, you know, simply a, a bunch of people around us that are that are you know, making noise. We can put the noise canceling headphones all <laughs> on all we want, but instead, how do we find that moment of solitude? Maybe it's stepping outside and taking a walk, whatever it might be, but to find in our day a few moments particularly to do that. Well, thank you so much, Father Frank Donio. You can find the Catholic Apostolate Center linked at sunrisemorningshow.com. Headlines up next, it's 17 past. Support for the Sunrise Morning Show is from Visiting Angels. Visiting Angels provides experienced, compassionate care to millions of aging adults nationwide by keeping them safe and healthy in the comfort of their own home. Whether it's a short break for caregivers or for long-term assistance, Visiting Angels provides hygiene, meals, light housework, companionship, and more. And services are available up to 24 hours per day. Visiting Angels, 
online at visitingangels.com. That's visitingangels.com. Franchise opportunities available. Are you looking for peace, longing for joy? Want to meet the giver of all goodness? God is calling the laity to bring Ignatian prayer into a suffering world. Work for the new evangelization. Go to lordteachmetopray.com. Order your free digital training and manual. Find true happiness and everlasting joy. Go to lordteachmetopray.com and click on the red button today. It's free. Approved by the USCCB. Have you subscribed to get the Sunrise Morning Show show notes? When you subscribe, the show notes arrive in your inbox weekday mornings with the list of featured guests, books, articles, and websites we'll discuss. And then you'll also get the podcast with markers to quickly find and hear an interview again or to see the Sunrise Morning Show on video. So to know when your favorite guests are on, go to sunrisemorningshow.com and click subscribe. Catechism in a Year with me, Father Mike Schmitz, is now available right here on Catholic Radio. Encounter God's plan of sheer goodness for us, revealed in Scripture and passed down through the tradition of the Catholic faith as we journey together toward our heavenly home. Bible in a Year and Catechism in a Year with Father Mike Schmitz, tonight at 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific on EWTN Radio. 19 past. Here's Anna with headlines. The U.S. says it would not support a potential Israeli attack in the Gaza city of Rafa. The Vatican yesterday released the Pope's message for the World Day of Prayer and Awareness Against Human Trafficking. And the Holy Father met yesterday with members of the Dicastery for Divine Worship. Now is probably the easiest time easiest Sunday of the year to invite your fellow parishioners to listen to Catholic Radio. Everybody wants to do something. Switch to Catholic Radio for Lent. There has never it's, been an easier Sunday than it's the Sunday not, before Lent to tell people to switch over to Catholic Radio. And you can tell them it's not as big a penance as you might it's not think. not as big. The morning show's a little rough, but the rest of it's Matt's, really good. Matt's jokes are a penance. I mean, there's no doubt about it, but... Well, we have free downloadable posters... At and little cards, com, like the little business notes. cards you can cut out. We have posters for your parish bulletin board and even little business cards you can hand out. Download them in the show notes at sunrisemorningshow.com. Cooperative advertising. It's used by businesses that include the mention of a manufacturer of a product who in turn repays the business for part of the cost of their ad. A good example might be an insurance agent mentioning the brand name insurance she sells in her ad. Co-op ads are a cost-effective way your business can reach customers. And at Sacred Heart Radio, we've had a few underwriters who've used co-op advertising to assist in the cost of their underwriting. You want to learn more? Email me, Leah, at sacredheartradio.com. Current events remind us that life can change without warning. The team at Gate of Heaven Catholic Cemetery is available to assist you in planning for the inevitable. The Catholic Church teaches the importance of a respectful Christian burial for the body, which was a temple of the Holy Spirit. This includes cremated remains. Give the gift of peace of mind to your family and be assured that your faithful intentions are secured. Call 513-489-0300 or visit gateofheaven.org. Wimberg Landscaping, a proud supporter of Sacred Heart Radio, has been beautifying properties for over 40 years. Wimberg offers professional one-stop landscaping services from initial design and installation of all plant materials and hardscapes to ongoing maintenance, including lawn service, leaf and snow removal. Wimberg Landscaping. 513-271-2332 or on the web at wimberglandscaping.com. That's wimberglandscaping.com. A wedding is a day. A marriage is a lifetime. Catholic Engaged Encounter Weekends are a marriage preparation program led by married couples and a priest or deacon. This is time for a couple to learn about each other and their upcoming marriage. Based on communication, intimacy, and the family they grew up in, Find out more at cincinnati-covington.engagedencounter.com. That's cincinnati-covington.engagedencounter.com.
It's time for our weekly Old Testament Bible study. We've been using a Catholic guide to the Old Testament from Ascension Press. You can get your own copy at ascensionpress.com slash Old Testament. And we are back with one of the contributors, Dr. Jeffrey Morrow. Good morning, Dr. Morrow. Good morning. It's wonderful to be here. It is wonderful to have you back, even though we're going to be talking about laments today. The Book of Lamentation. So last time we talked about the prophet Jeremiah. And as we move on to Lamentations, this is actually attributed to Jeremiah, correct? I mean, what are some indicators that these books are connected? Well, I think part of it is the style, but part of it is the style is actually very different in a lot of places as well, which is why some scholars will distinguish them. But I think the content really... So even when we talk about Jeremiah, writing Jeremiah, that doesn't necessarily mean he put finger to pen to to scroll for everything. So he had a prophet Baruch, which we'll be talking about later um, at some point, and Baruch, he said, you know, God says, you know, you know, write this, have Baruch write the scroll and give it to the king. So um, I think that's part of the, the indication is that it's dealing with the same time period, the same themes, yes. the so, same situation. So this book, much shorter than the book of the prophet Jeremiah, can you take us through what we read in the book of Lamentations? Sure, Lamentations fundamentally, at its literal level, is about the destruction of the of the city and the temple in Jerusalem, um, about 586, some dated 587 BC, um, when Babylon came, Babylon came in and, and destroyed the city. I mean, this was so devastating. It's we can't really um, really grasp it. I mean, it's the temple they, they thought would never go down. It was one of these great wonders. It was amazing under King Solomon. As all of his wealth, he built this massive temple. And, and Jerusalem was an impregnable city, set on these hills, seven hills. You really couldn't get in there, and yet Babylon destroyed it, and that was a sign from God. Mm-hmm. So Lamentations is wonderful. In one level, like the Lamenting Psalms, they're really, you can, anybody can relate to this who's been in suffering, where there's no real answer, where, you know, you can lament, you know, um, I'm looking at Lamentations uh, 120, Behold, O Lord, for I am in distress, my soul is in tumult. My heart is wrung within me, right? And so the l- laments, these cries of lament and these prayers of lament are, in a sense, at some level, they are a form of prayer where we cry out to God. Specifically with Lamentations, it's about the destruction of God's temple in Jerusalem. Um, but what we have is this beautiful, this beautiful underscoring of God's steadfast love, that it's going to remain forever, mm-hmm. despite sin, despite misfortune, despite suffering. And the way the Church Fathers would sometimes read this is the difficulties, even the difficulties caused from our own sins, right, can become these means of return, and they become, they become therapeutic. And that really is how the prophets, I think, Jeremiah, Lamentations, etc., um, understand what's happening. At one level, this destruction is because of the sins of the people. They didn't keep the Sabbaths, they oppressed the poor, they worshipped false gods, and they're given over to the hands of the Gentiles, in a sense, the gods that they've been worshiping. But this becomes a means of return to the Lord. The suffering that they're experiencing is a way in which the Lord will allow them to turn back to Him. Yeah, it's such a beautiful point, because we as Catholics, with the fullness of revelation and and the coming of Christ and the incarnation and His death and resurrection, can look at something like Lamentations and, and glean a lot of hope from it. Oh, yeah. If I could just quote one more, chapter 3. Um, I mean, this is beautiful. We think of this as this really sad, and you know, it is. It's a lament. And yet we have this affirmation, verse 22 and following of chapter 3, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Mm. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. And this is in the midst of the worst destruction they had ever seen. I mean, everything seemed hopeless. And eventually, once you have the death of the kings of Judah, it seems like, well, God, how is God going to fulfill his promise to have a, a David, a king of David forever? His throne will be for all generations. How will this happen? So it's, it's yeah. a sign of hope. Well, especially, I mean, I, I do think it is, um, shall we say, educational to try to put ourselves in their place. I mean, it talks about how women were eating their children in exile. That was how hungry they were. This is out of Deuteronomy. So these are the curses in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy says this is what will happen for those of you under the Deuteronomic Covenant in Deuteronomy. 
this is what will happen. And it's really gruesome. I quote it usually in my class, and it's disgusting. Yeah. And um, although we have discussions of it here, it happens again when the, um, after the New T- Testament time period, when the Romans come in and destroy Jerusalem, and they destroy the Second Temple. Yeah. We, have, we have actually historical accounts of Titus going in there and finding people actually doing that again. Wow. It's horrific. Wow. Yeah. Well, I know you grew up Jewish, Dr. Morrow, so I'm, yeah. I'm interested in how Jews look back on, on a book like Lamentations, on, sure. on the time of the Babylonian exile and, and the destruction of the temple. This, yeah, so this becomes central, but especially as it relates to the destruction of the Second Temple. So if you go today to the Western Wall, sometimes it's called the Wailing Wall. And mm-hmm. if you go there in Jerusalem, you will sometimes see people beating their breasts crying, screaming. You know, I've been there, and you hear, I've heard women just screaming in, in pain and sorrow, and, and what, they're, what they're doing is they're mourning the loss of Jerusalem, the temple, um, and, and, and wishing that God would restore the temple and bring the Messiah um, and usher in the Messianic age, which we as Christians believe has happened, that Jesus is the new temple, and that the Messiah has come, and he will come again. But this is, this is very important because these laments are not just for, they're used now liturgically and, and prayerfully in Judaism, not just for the destruction of the old, but for the destruction of the second, and for this kind of hope and expectation that God will still redeem his people, that the redemption is somewhere off in the future. We've been talking to Dr. Jeffrey Morrow. The book is called A Catholic Guide to the Old Testament. You can get your own copy at ascensionpress.com slash Old Testament or find it linked at sunrisemorningshow.com. Dr. Morrow, thank you so much. Thank you. Half past the hour now on the Sunrise Morning Show. It's time for news. The U.S. says it would not support an attack by Israel in the Gaza city of Rafah. The city in the southern end of the Gaza Strip is packed with more than a million Palestinians, many of them refugees in the war between Israel and Hamas. A State Department spokesman yesterday said Israeli ground operation in the city would be a, quote, disaster. However, noting that Washington has yet to see any evidence of serious planning for this kind of attack. Rafa is a major entry point for humanitarian aid in Gaza. In Washington, a bill to provide aid to Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan is moving forward in the Senate. Mark Mayfield reports. The Senate voted in favor of advancing the foreign aid package on Thursday after Republicans in the chamber rejected a broader bill including border policy changes. The 67 to 32 vote means that the Senate can begin consideration of the $95 billion package. It's still unclear if the aid package can ultimately make it through Congress. I'm Mark Mayfield. Former President Trump has won the Republican caucuses in Nevada. Yesterday evening, he won in a landslide, hours after he also secured a victory in the caucuses in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Trump didn't face any major competition in Nevada, though. GOP opponent Nikki Haley had chosen to compete in Nevada's primary on Tuesday. Trump has claimed... All 26 of Nevada's GOP delegates, moving him one step closer to the Republican presidential nomination. President Biden yesterday praised the special counsel's decision to not file charges against him for retaining classified documents. He noted the special counsel's report laid out differences between Biden's handling and Donald Trump's handling of classified materials. The report does note Biden voluntarily returned the documents and cooperated with the investigation while Trump now faces an indictment for allegedly obstructing the government's efforts to retrieve the classified materials. Trump, for his part, says the lack of charges in President Biden's report is a, quote, selective prosecution. The Vatican yesterday released the Pope's message for the World Day of Prayer and Awareness Against Human Trafficking for the Feast of St. Josephine Bakita. From Vatican Radio, Deborah Castellano-Lubov reports. I associate myself wholeheartedly with all of you around the world, especially the young who are working to combat this global scourge. As he repeated, it is never too late to take action. The church's theme for this year's day is journeying in dignity, listen, dream, act. In his message, the Pope urged everyone to walk in the footsteps of St. Josephine Bakita, who was trafficked herself as a child. 
He said St. Paquita encourages us to open our eyes and ears to see those who go unseen and to hear those who have no voice, to acknowledge the dignity of each person and to fight trafficking and all forms of exploitation. Lamenting that trafficking often goes unseen, the Pope urged, let us help one another to be more responsive. The Pope appealed for listening to suffering victims. May we listen to their cry for help and feel challenged by the stories they tell, he said. The Holy Father encouraged all efforts that better enable people to live with freedom and dignity and called for taking concrete actions to combat trafficking. At each and every level, he exhorted, let us pray fervently and work proactively for this cause. While we know the fight against trafficking can be won, he suggested, it is necessary to get to the root of the problem and eliminate its causes. The Pope went on to encourage all efforts to respond to the phenomenon following St. Paquita's example. It is a call to action, to mobilize all our resources. He warned, if we close our eyes and ears, if we do nothing, we will be guilty of complicity. Pope Francis concluded by expressing his heartfelt gratitude to everyone engaged in the celebration of this day and blessing all committed to combating trafficking and all forms of exploitation. I'm Deborah Castellana Lubov. Yesterday, executives at Johnson and Johnson, Merck, and Bristol Myers Squibb were summoned in front of the Senate Health Committee and were confronted about American drug prices. They conceded patients in the United States are paying too much but placed blame on pharmacy benefit managers. The Department of Health and Human Services found in 2022 that even when taking into account the discounts Americans receive from health plans and employers pay, people still pay on average at least three times as much. That's the news. You're listening to the Sunrise Morning Show. It's 35 minutes past the hour. The Sunrise Now you can use Venmo to give to Sacred Heart Radio. Just type in at Sacred Heart Radio, all one word, to give a gift of any amount. To help broadcast God's life-giving message over our seven media platforms, use Venmo at Sacred Heart Radio. Schneller Knockelman Plumbing, Heating, and Air is a proud supporter of Sacred Heart Radio. Stay warm and comfortable during the coldest of weather with Schneller Knockelman for your heating repair, replacement, and maintenance. Find us at skpha.com, skpha.com. Support for Sacred Heart Radio is from Delhi and Harrison Pet Centers with everything your pet needs from guppies to puppies. Offering curbside pickup in-store and online shopping at DelhiPetCenter.com. That's DelhiPetCenter.com. Support for Sacred Heart Radio is from Sunset Janitorial Supply, a Catholic family business supplying the tri-state cleaning industry with commercial cleaning supplies, personal hygiene, equipment, and even machine repair. Free delivery to your business. More information at SunsetJanitorialSupply.com. It's 24 minutes before the hour on this Friday, February the 9th. Your forecast is brought to you on Sacred Heart Catholic Radio by Schneller Knockman Plumbing, Heating, and Air online at skpha.com. Getting even warmer today, and it's rather warm outside right now with temperatures in the lower 50s as you're heading out the door. For Cincinnati, mostly cloudy skies today, an isolated evening rain chance and a high of 62 some scattered showers and a few downpours possible tonight with an overnight low of 54. Rain ends early tomorrow, then it'll be mostly cloudy and mild with a high of 60 degrees. For the Miami Valley-Dayton area, cloudy early, then partly cloudy this afternoon with a high of 62. Increasing clouds with showers late tonight and an overnight low of 50. Rain showers early, then decreasing clouds later in the day and a high tomorrow of 57 degrees. This is Sacred Heart Catholic Radio. The Sunrise Morning Show continues. And just a reminder, as we mentioned a few minutes ago, Sunday is going to be like the easiest opportunity ever. The easiest opportunity the whole year to invite your fellow parishioners to listen to Catholic Radio because it's the last Sunday before Lent and everybody's looking for something to help them enter more spiritually into this season of prayer and fasting and almsgiving. Just tell them, hey, did you know there's free Catholic radio 24-7 in our town? And then just tell them where to turn. I'm Matt Swaim, joined now by Bobby Schindler from the Terry Schiavo Life and Hope Network. They're online at lifeandhope.com. Good morning, Bobby. Good morning, Matt. So uh, physician-assisted suicide is something that is uh, increasingly uh, 
you know, it's getting more and more attention in more and more states. I wonder if you could kind of catch us up to what things are like in the various states at the moment. Yes, you know, I can just tell, Matt, that things are picking up because I'm getting contacted and being asked to, to be more involved in, in the physician suicide issue, uh, assisted suicide. You know, typically, we spend our day working on cases, and we've been, we've been receiving a lot of cases from families, and, and they're more of medical futility, withdrawal of care, denial of care. And we haven't really gotten into the physician assisted suicide as much, but it's really been picking up. I just act, actually submitted written testimony from Michigan because they had a hearing coming up in the not, not too distant future. But So right now, Matt, we have 10 states and the District of Columbia that, that have legalized assisted suicide here in America. I won't even talk about beyond the United States where it's, it's worse. Um, but right now, in the first two weeks of January, Matt, eight states have introduced bills to pass assisted suicide. New Hampshire, Wisconsin, Indiana, Missouri, Tennessee, Virginia, Rhode Island, and Florida. Now, it doesn't mean that they're going to pass. Uh, but potentially they can. And then they also have eight states on top of that that have carried over with their legislation from 2023. And they're Massachusetts, New York, Iowa, Michigan, Delaware, Pennsylvania, Minnesota, and North Carolina. And Maryland has a hearing set for February 16th uh, where they're trying to pass suicide. So in total, so say hypothetically, worst-case scenario, uh, you have potentially uh, 16 states this year that could pass doctor assisted suicide now chances are they they won't but i'm sure they're going to they're going to pluck off a few uh to pass so if say if, if all if all 16 on top of the 10 you would have over half of the states in the u.s that would be legalized assisted suicide if, if, if it would come true from what's you know sitting in front of us right now well assisted suicide uh there are some some general parameters uh and and legalities even for those states that allow it uh, but what are some of the ways that we need to be paying attention uh, to that people are trying to use as loopholes to to try and get around some of this to advance the cause of assisted suicide through sort of nefarious and loopholy means? Right, and and Wesley writes a lot about this, how disingenuous the assisted, assisted suicide movement is. You know, I, mean, I just wanted to mention it's almost like you know why is it all picking up? Not not all of a sudden. I mean, they've always been active and persistent. But it seems so even more now, and, and it seems to me that, you know, much of the pro-life community, which fights back, pushes back against assisted suicide, you know, they're using a lot of their resources right now fighting what's going on with the abortion issue. You know, with the states trying to, they're trying to enshrine the Constitution to, to legalize assisted suicide, these pro-abortion groups. So I think they realize that now is the time to strike, that the pro-life community is spending a lot of their resources fighting abortion, and they have less resources or people available, so to speak, to fight against assisted suicide. So, so they, they feel this is a good opportunity for them to maybe make some inroads uh, because um, you know some of these resources aren't available to fight back. So, but one, one of the scary things, Matt. Well, one one is they're 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 legalizing they're, the states that have legalized assisted suicide. Vermont and Oregon have already done this. They're, they've dropped the law where others can travel to those states because it's legal there. So say uh, Florida, it's illegal. I could go to, uh, if I were to travel to or Ohio, if I were to travel to, uh, to uh, uh, Oregon or, or Vermont, I could, I could prescribe lethal injection or lethal meds to kill myself so I can travel there. And Colorado is trying to do the same thing. They already have legalized this is a suicide. They're trying to drop the travel ban so people can travel there as well. Um, so that's one loophole that they're, they're doing. They're also having a Zoom and Skype where you can uh, visit or go on you know, through Zoom or Skype and, and visit a doctor and prescribe lethal meds through Zoom or, or, or Skype. So they're trying to, as Wesley writes, they're trying to nationalize assisted suicide and circumvent the states where it is illegal, uh, have other ways people can ask, access assisted suicide. Well, there are uh, a bunch of other things, as I was reading through the the article from Wesley, uh, about the ways that people are trying to get around stuff. So a person with dementia, you know, is not necessarily dying, uh, but they're – and they also can't necessarily freely consent, (laughs) you know, in the same way that a person uh, who has all their mental faculties can consent to these sorts of things. But uh, there's this question of if someone is off of food and water long enough, they can be – 
diagnosed as dying, and then it's a dying person can get assisted suicide, which is scary to me for a number of reasons, one of which is because I've had family members with dementia. And you know what one of the things that they have trouble with is? Remembering to eat. Or like you, you kind of sort of have to help remind them to eat. Or maybe even with a plate of food in front of them, they don't always know what to do with it. Uh, you could very easily see how that could be completely abused, completely abused to force someone down that road faster. Yeah, it, it's really disturbing. When you, when you read all what, what they're trying to do um, to, to, to circumvent you know, the, the laws, these strict, so to speak, guidelines, right, Matt, to prevent people from committing assisted suicide, where they're actually considering, right now you have to have six months or less diagnosis of terminal illness to be qualified for assisted suicide. So they're actually saying if you stop eating and drinking, you would reach the, the point where you would be considered terminal and then thus qualify for assisted suicide, which is, it's, it's really, uh, you know, lack of a better way of saying, this is really messed up, Matt, when, when you think about some of these, some of what they're, what they're trying to um, uh, you know, pass or, or uh, allow under the law. To, to qualify for assisted suicide. I mean, if they can think it, they're going to try and do it. And it's just, uh, it's disturbing. You know, Wesley really follows these things. And he and he really paints, paints a very dark and grim picture of the future of, of this culture of death and the assisted suicide movement because they are making progress. And, and when they think of things like this, it's just a matter of time before these things start passing and more and more people are going to be eligible to kill themselves. Yeah, and the more and more that there, I mean, there are all these external factors, uh, you know, the artificial intelligence culture that, you know, makes humans in general feel less and less useful. And so, that, I mean, that colors the whole question, too. There are just so many angles of this, and, and it's just a reminder that we need to have the whole picture of the dignity of the human person that helps flesh out everything from conception to natural death. Otherwise, these kinds of things can sort of sneak in, and we don't feel like we have a footing to fight them. So Bobby Schindler, I'm very grateful for your vigilance on these questions. If our listeners want to connect with you, how do they do so? Sure. It's lifeandhope.com, lifeandhope.com. Linked at sunrisemorningshow.com. Thanks, Bobby. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Matt. God bless you. All right. Coming up after the break, we'll have headlines with Anna Mitchell, and we'll look ahead to the Sunday Mass readings with Father Jonathan Duncan from the Diocese of Charleston. So please do stay with us. It's a quarter till. Support is from MediShare. Let's see, if something costs less, but people are happier with it, that sounds like something to look into, and that is MediShare. Maybe you've heard switching to MediShare to pay for health care can save many families up to 500 bucks a month, and that is huge. But it's also true that people are way more satisfied after making the switch, too. The member satisfaction rate for MediShare is double that of the typical health insurance plan. Double. MediShare works, too. It's been around for 30 years. Members have shared more than $5 billion of each other's bills. People love having telehealth and a huge nationwide PPO network. So, yeah, really, you can save a ton and like it better. Imagine being happy with how you're taking care of your health care. So if you're self-employed or part of the gig economy or you just want to plan you're happy with. You can call right now. You'll get a price within two minutes. So see what you can say. This is a very, very smart use of two minutes. Here's the number you need. Call 877-64-BIBLE. That's 877-64-BIBLE. 877-64-BIBLE. It's always harder to get out of bed when it's cold outside. So give yourself something to look forward to, like Mystic Monk Coffee for the first cup of the day. You can find a link to Mystic Monk Coffee at our site, sunrisemorningshow.com, and we earn a commission on anything you buy through that link. You can also treat yourself to a Sunrise Morning Show mug, which you can buy through our online store. Check out the mugs and link to Mystic Monk Coffee through sonrisemorningshow.com. That's sunrisemorningshow.com. This is Conversations with Consequences, where we delve deeper into issues affecting our church, our country, and our core, the family. As Catholics, we need to be informed, aware, and able to talk through some of the tough topics that we're facing in our culture and in our world. Conversations with Consequences gives us the tools to do so. It's not enough to pray. We have to be a light for the world. Conversations with Consequences, tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio. Hi, this is Janet Williams. Please join us for Women of Grace today at 11 a.m. Eastern Time on EWTN Radio. 
wipe that sleep out of your eyes. And now back to the Sunrise Morning Show. 12 Till, here's Anna with headlines. The U.S. says it would not support a potential Israeli attack in the Gaza city of Rafah, major entry point for humanitarian aid in Gaza. The Vatican yesterday released the Pope's message for the World Day of Prayer and Awareness Against Human Trafficking for the Feast of St. Josephine Bakita. And the Holy Father met yesterday with members of the Dicastery for Divine Worship and Discipline of the Sacraments, speaking about the reform of the liturgy. News at the top and bottom of each hour every weekday morning here on the Sunrise Morning Show. I'm Matt Swaim, joined now by Father Jonathan Duncan from the Diocese of Charleston. He joins us each week around this time to take a look at the Mass readings for Sunday. Father Duncan, good morning. Good to be with you, Matt. All right, so Mark chapter 1, uh, we hear for the sixth Sunday in Ordinary Time as the main gospel. And uh, at the surface, what a lot of us will hear is that a man with leprosy comes to Jesus, asks to be healed. Jesus heals him. Pretty cool story. Uh, but if you dig into this, there are lots and lots of questions that this whole exchange raises. Um, the first one is is kind of the question that that like your your fourth grader might ask you, which is like, what would it have looked like when it says that the leprosy left him immediately and he was made clean? Like, how did that happen? Was there like a a bright light? Like, did the scabs just disappear? Like, you, I don't know if your kids ever ask questions like this. This is the kind of questions that I get. No, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I have no idea. All I know is that was probably the best day in this guy's life. <laughs> that all of a sudden, yeah. this affliction, which was not only uh, physically debilitating and and slowly killing him, you know, that his 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 own flesh was rotting. Um, and in addition, and this is this is the really significant piece, and we we get this, of course, from the, our Old Testament reading. Um, he's he's an outcast, right? He's an outcast. I mean, this is I think what a lot of people, you know, at, at first glance they're gonna they're gonna hear these readings, and of course, the reason we have that Old Testament is because we have this particular gospel. But a lot of people are gonna gonna hear the Old Testament. And it's going to sound very cold and clinical, because we have have within that um, essentially instruction for how to deal with leprosy. You know, if someone has on his skin a scab, and it's these like very particular, um, you know, regulations. And it, if we look at those passages, we're going to be tempted, uh, you know, to say, well, you know, it seems like in the Old Testament. You know, God was, was mean to the lepers, you know. They had to be kind of away from the people, and there's all these regulations about what they could do. And I think, I think first we have to remember that um, part of the purpose of the law in the Old Covenant was to keep God's people whole and intact so that they could bring forth the Messiah, the light to the Gentiles, right? And Can't so, do that if they all die of leprosy. That's true. So some of this is simply for for the protection of the community. But then I think there's a there's a deeper point here, which is we see in the Old Testament that all of these things that make you unclean um, are ultimately connected to disorder. And of course, the thing in in the in the Old Covenant law that was most unclean. It was the highest level of unclean, was the dead, right? You touch the dead, and their uncleanness connects to you. Then all of a sudden, you're unclean. You touch a leper, and their defilement connects to you. And what's, what's beautiful in the gospel, all of that was pointing forward to one who would come among us and say, I'm going to take the most unclean thing there is, which is death decay, the rot of my good creation, and I'm going to consume that. Let it consume me so that I can consume it. In other words, I'm going to be like those lepers that Moses talks about. I'm going to be cast out, right? I'm going to be outside the city. I'm going to be away. I'm going to be outside. And yet, the beauty of, of the gospel is that when we encounter Christ, instead of our defilement, our sin, our death, defiling him, 
it, it happens the other way around, right? His life, his healing comes to us, and that's what we see in the gospel reading, right? So it's this, it's this beautiful interchange. But if you just look at the surface, you can be tempted to say, like, well, you know, why was, uh, why was God so mean in the Old Testament? And in the gospel, Jesus is like the nice guy coming around. And I think we have to have just kind of a bigger picture of well, the role do. of leprosy and what these and, things signify. And Jesus gives us that bigger picture in sort of a weird way. You know, the, uh, the general thought, as you say, is Old Testament God mean, New Testament God nice. Right? <laughs> there's that yeah, false dichotomy. Yeah. It's a heresy called Marcionism that the church condemned pretty early on. Yep. But there's this weird thing that happens. Jesus doesn't say, ignore all that stuff from the Old Testament. I'm here now. We're doing something different. Uh, instead, Jesus, who is King of kings and Lord of lords, he is the word through which uh, the world was created. He has power over everything. He is fully God, fully man. He heals this leper in a miraculous way. And then he says, Okay, now go do what the law says uh, regarding Moses and show yourself to the priest, <laughs> right? It's such a weird thing that after he, who has power over everything, still sends this man back to check it with the Mosaic law. The reason being, that moment, I, I, I believe, that moment where Jesus says, go now, show yourself to the priest, I believe that was the fulfillment of the whole reason that law was given to Moses in the first place, right? It's, it's the law was meant to point to the fulfillment. And so that, those words in the law were all given so that one day the very word of God, not written on stone, but very God, very God, truly man, would come and fulfill that so that the law itself is bearing witness to the Son of God, and that this is, he is the one now where healing is to be. You want to find healing? It's going to be in Jesus. You want to, you want to know where to go to offer your worship? It's Jesus. You want to know where to go to have your sins forgiven? Because, again, the temple was the place where all of that stuff was, was believed to, to happen, and yet he's saying, no, 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 you want your sins forgiven. You want healing. You want hope of, of life from death. It's me. And even the law is going to bear witness to that and give thanks for that, which is what he sends him off to do. Well, we talk about how we want our uh, the, st- the the law that's written on stone is now going to be written in our hearts. Uh, the stony heart is replaced with flesh. Well, the written law, right, is now become flesh in Christ Jesus, right? Like all these yep. things take on this whole new level. The only other thing I want to you know get your opinion on here, Father, before I let you go is it seems like a whole lot of people. Uh, don't listen to Jesus whenever he heals them and says, don't go tell anybody, because this leper is not the only one who goes out and breaks that, uh, breaks that confidence. It's hard when, and it's not just that he had this amazing thing happen, that he received this gift of healing. That, that would be reason enough to tell people. But it's because he's now found someone in his life who both loves him enough and has the power enough to be able to change his life, to bring life out of death, healing out of disease, and that is really good news, and you just got to share it. Yeah, he is not only healed physically, he is healed spiritually, he is reconciled with God, and he's reconciled with God's people (laughs) by going back and checking with the priests under the law of Moses. Have a great day, Father. We'll talk to you soon. That wraps it up for the last Sunrise Morning Show. Uh, during the last full week of Ordinary Time. We just got a couple of days next week. We got Shrove Monday, a.k.a. Bacon Monday. We got Shrove Tuesday and then Ash Wednesday next week. We will talk to you then. In the meantime, may God bless you and keep you and grant you his peace. Family, thank you for putting a Sacred Heart Radio bumper magnet on your vehicle because our recent listener survey told us just how many of you started listening after seeing one of our bumper magnets. In fact, some have declared that our bumper magnets are life changers. So to change lives, just take a drive. Showing off your Sacred Heart Radio bumper magnet. Now they're free, so to get one or a stack for your parish, go to sacredheartradio.com and click Signs and Magnets. That's sacredheartradio.com. Click Signs and Magnets. I'm Emily Mackey, inviting you to an inspiring event for the pro-life community, a pro-life gathering for her. 
I'll be there to discuss theology of the body. Joining me will be pro-life advocate Rebecca Hagan and Donna Murphy of Heaven's Gain Ministries. The day includes mass, confession, and lunch. It's Saturday, February 24th at St. Susanna Church in Mason, brought to you by Cincinnati and Dayton Right to Life. For tickets, CincinnatiRightToLife.org. That's CincinnatiRightToLife.org. Looking for a way to grow closer to your faith with your family this summer? Try a Holy Family Fest at Catholic Family Land, located 20 minutes from Steubenville, Ohio. Family activities along with mass, rosary, confession, and guest speakers create the perfect blend of excitement and ample time spent renewing your faith to allow life-changing encounters with the Lord. Financial assistance is available for families in need. Register online at afc.org. Support for Sacred Heart Radio is from Honda East, with evening and weekend hours designed to make servicing your vehicle easy. Honda East, just off I-275 on Beachmont Avenue. Help me, Honda East, get the car that I want. Online at HondaEastCincy.com. For over 50 years, the St. Martin District of St. Vincent de Paul has been providing food, clothing, rent, and utility assistance to people in six counties of Southern Ohio. You can join the St. Martin District of St. Vincent de Paul in helping our neighbors with a monetary or vehicle donation, which is simple and easy. 800-322-8284 or donate online at runforthepoor.org. Hi, I'm Jim Akers, board member with the Cincinnati Chapter of Legatus, Catholic business leaders and their spouses meeting the challenge of balancing faith, family, and business. We meet once a month for mass and dinner, along with a local or national speaker and a wonderful venue throughout the city. Many of our speakers you have heard right here on Sacred Heart Radio. Please think about joining our group of Catholic leaders and become an ambassador for Christ in your business or profession. Contact us at Cincinnati at Legatus.org. That's Cincinnati at Legatus.org. This is Bishop Roger Foyes of Covington. Thank you for listening to Sacred Heart Catholic Radio. 740 WNOP Newport, 910 WPFB Middletown, or get the app, stream, podcast, and more at SacredHeartRadio.com. Sacred Heart Radio. Let us pray the sun. 